If our faith is strong enough to do that, we'll be able to say, like Horatio Spafford did, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river and a death my way when sorrows like sea was roll and Good evening. If we could settle in and get ready for tonight's service, just a reminder if you have a cell phone, if you could turn it off or put it on silence so it doesn't disturb tonight's preaching. And if we could bow our heads for a word of prayer. The Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for another night that we can gather together here in peace and safety, Lord. To the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, and I just want to thank you once again for the building that you provided for us, Lord. For your faithfulness to us, Lord, which is renewed every day. And all the blessings that go along with the salvation that we have in Christ. I pray, Father, for the pastor as he brings forth your message. I pray for our hearts, Lord, that it will be open to receive it. And I lift up those that couldn't make it tonight, Lord, and also that those that couldn't that we haven't seen in a while, Father, especially those, I pray you would just bring them back to the fellowship of the brethren, Lord, and draw them back to you, Father. You know them by name. 
We thank you for the opportunity that we have here. We thank you for our pastor, Lord, and all the hours of study that he puts in to teach us your word. We pray, Father, it would just be a blessing tonight that it would bring glory and honor to your son, Jesus. Once again, in his name we pray. Amen. If we could stand and praise the Lord.
Amen. You may be seated. Children can be dismissed to their class. A couple announcements. Friday there will be service as usual here in the chapel at 7. And this coming Saturday will be our youth group gathering. That's for ages 9 to 16. So if you know anybody at that age, it's a great time to get together and not only learn about God, but get, you know, build um, fellowship and bonds with the young people. Um, so that's 5 to 7 on this coming Saturday. With that said, now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our pastor, Pastor John Ritchie. Amen. Praise God. I'd like you to turn your Bible to Hebrews 10, then we're going to have a word of prayer. If you'll take your Bible and turn me to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll begin there in a moment. Um, I received a prayer re request from one of our online followers, uh, Daniel Berta. Danielle Berta uh, is a follower of us online. Her and her, her husband and her family are moving from Nevada to Arizona this weekend. They'll be traveling, and they asked that we would you know, pray for their trip and their transition. So we, I would ask you to do, we'll pray now and ask you to keep them in prayer. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, they consider us, they said we, we want prayer from our church and we consider Grace Christian Fellowship our church. So, you know, uh, the folks online have a tremendous uh, loyalty, allegiance, and attachment to this body. And uh, we do wanna be supportive of them as much as we possibly can. So let's lift them up in prayer, all right? If we could bow our heads and we'll go before the Lord. Father, tonight, we're so grateful and thankful once again to be able to have this time to spend together in your word. And I, I do pray tonight that you would challenge our hearts from the things we're about to note and study. And Lord, tonight we lift up our brothers and sisters, Danielle and her husband, Lord, as they, and their family as they travel from Nevada to Arizona over this week, Lord, and weekend. And we do pray, Father, that you would make it a smooth and a joyful transition, Lord. We pray that you would grant them traveling mercy. We pray, Lord, that you would give them peace and strength and confidence in you during the trip, Lord. We pray that it be a time of seeing your hand at work in their life, oh Lord, and encouraging them. We pray that you do encourage them and strengthen them for this task that they have ahead and above all we pray for mercies as they travel protection of your hand upon them Lord that they will arrive safely to their destination and that they could settle in Lord and get down to the business of life again Lord in this new place and so we put them in your hands and we entrust them to you and we thank you for that and we also pray tonight, Lord, I pray that I could speak with wisdom and grace and humility, conviction, passion. Lord, that I could speak with the authority that your word deserves, and I might take the knowledge you've given me on this subject and make it clear and accurate and understandable, that your people might hear and be blessed. And if there be anyone within the sound of my voice that hears this message tonight or in the future over the internet, my prayer, Father, is that if they are unsaved, that you would convict them of their sin and of their need of Jesus Christ, that they might believe upon him and receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in his precious name. And we ask these things now in his name. Amen and amen. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And tonight we're going to continue looking at the important subject of the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 in a moment. We've noted already under this study of the Holy Spirit's work and ministry that for the believer, the Holy Spirit regenerates them. That means it gives them eternal life, creates a new nature in them. That's when you're born again. And then the Holy Spirit 
indwells the believer. He resides in the believer, abides in the believer permanently. The Holy Spirit baptizes the believer into union with Christ so that the believer is now totally identified with Christ. The believer is in Christ and is no longer identified with Adam. The believer is now justified and accepted completely forever. And we began looking at the sealing of the Holy Spirit, which speaks of the fact that the believer's salvation is secure, that what the believer has received from God at the moment of faith is secure. And the thing we must understand in this study is that salvation from the penalty of sin. The word salvation appears many times in the Bible, but you always have to ask, saved from what? Because we could be saved from false doctrine. We could be saved from the power of sin, which is what? Spiritual growth. We could be saved from deception. We could be saved from troubles and problems. Or we could be saved from the lake of fire. What salvation is being spoken of in context? When you see that word saved or salvation, it does not always refer to being rescued from hell. In fact, you'll read in the Psalms many times where David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. He's not saying the Lord is saving me. He's talking there about the Lord delivering him from the troubles and the problems he was in. He was being pursued and attacked by Saul and persecuted, and he's saying, the Lord is going to save me from these troubles and these problems. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, continue in study of the word, 1 Timothy chapter 4, continue studying the word and you will save yourself and them that hear you. He meant, if you keep studying the word, you'll save yourself from the false teachers that are out there preaching false doctrine, especially the Gnostics, and you will save those that you teach from being caught in what? Satan's snare of false doctrine. So you always have to look at the context. We, there's salvation from the penalty of sin, the lake of fire, which most people think of when they think of salvation. There's salvation from the power of sin, which is spiritual growth now. Salvation from the penalty of sin took place in the past, the moment you believed in Christ. At that moment of time, you were regenerated and dwelt, baptized, and sealed by the Spirit. And then there's salvation from the power of sin, which is spiritual growth. And then there's salvation from the presence of sin. That'll take place in the future when Jesus comes. At his second coming, when every believer will receive a resurrected body, a perfect body, a glorified body, and will never sin again, and will be saved from the presence of sin forever. Okay. Now, we're looking here in Hebrews, and we began to note last week that salvation is sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that means... a finished transaction means ownership by God. We belong to him now. He's responsible for us. We're under his care. It's a finished transaction in that once you believe, you receive the gift, it's done. Salvation is not believe and keep believing. Salvation is believe right now, this minute. And once you believe, the Holy Spirit regenerates, indwells, baptizes, and seals you. And at that moment, you receive the gift, and it's a finished transaction. And then, of course, the seal represents security. Esther chapter 8, 8, the king put his seal on a document, and it said that no one could what? Reverse it. In the Bible, the seal represents not just ownership in a finished transaction, but it also represents security, that what God has given you, what the king has decreed, cannot be what? Changed, reversed, or revoked. Okay, let me give you an example which I showed you previously, and it's really simple. Simple example, using an empty bottle of water and a full bottle of water. Here's the believer, unsaved, dead in trespasses of sin, without the Spirit of God, lost, condemned, unrighteous. The believer, here's the gospel, that Christ died and rose again. And recognizes their sinfulness and puts their faith in what? What Jesus did on the cross, puts their faith in Christ. Confesses that he is Lord, died for their sins, rose again from the dead, believes in his heart unto righteousness. All his sins are forgiven. God declares him righteous and justified. And then at that moment, the Holy Spirit, which is represented by this full bottle of water, comes. And what does he do? He regenerates, 
indwells, baptizes, okay? He pours eternal life into what? The believer. And then he seals the believer, you see? And now the believer has received the gift of salvation. It's complete. It's a finished transaction. It's a done deal. The believer is now saved and sealed, meaning that what has been received is permanent and can never be lost. So no sin, no failure, no bad decision or poor judgment, mistake on the believer's part can ever undo the work of regeneration, indwelling, baptizing, and sealing of the believer. Once you're saved, you're always saved. It's called eternal security. If anyone preaches any other doctrine but that, they are not preaching the grace of God. They are preaching a perversion of the gospel. They are preaching another gospel. Salvation from the penalty of sin is a one-time event. Salvation from the power of sin, spiritual growth, living the Christian life, is a process of what? A lifetime. Salvation from the presence of sin will take place when? In the future when you receive a glorified body. And Jesus, remember last week we saw when he was speaking to the woman at the well, uh, he told her, you know, if you knew who you're talking to, you'd ask me and I'd give you a drink and you'd never be thirsty again. And of course, drinking represents what? It's a metaphor for what? Faith. Okay? And what he was saying is, if you believe in me right now, you will receive eternal life. And you'll never, what, be spiritually thirsty again because you will be saved. Notice he said, a drink. Now she said, well, give me this water so that I don't have to, what, come back to the well. She understood what he was saying in one sense and in another sense she didn't. She didn't understand he was talking about the spiritual gift of eternal life, but she did understand this. He meant drink just what, one time. Remember that? one drink and she was saying well if I take one drink out of this well I'll never have to come back every day and what fetch water that'd be great I'll never be thirsty again give me that she understood it was one drink now of course he was speaking about what eternal life salvation from the penalty of sin okay but the thing that we understand from that passage is it was one drink and it lasts what forever it's permanent okay now look here in Hebrews chapter 10 we began to look at this last class. I'm just going to go quickly. Look at verses 1 and 2. And I, again, I want to note, salvation is not a process. It is a one-time event. Salvation is an event. Salvation from the penalty of sin. Eternal life is an event. It is not a process. Verse 1, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. And here the, he's speaking about, he's writing to Hebrews who are Jews. They're used to what? The temple. They're used to the priesthood. They're used to the high priest taking the blood of the sacrifice, going into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and putting the blood on the mercy seat. Okay, and God would look down, he would see the blood on the mercy seat, and he would forgive the sins of the people for what? For one more year. But it says they had to be offered continually. The high, not one of those sacrifices of animals' blood was ever efficacious, meaning it never permanently took away sin. It never provided a... It was just a temporary covering. It, it pointed to who? The true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who would perfectly offer himself on the cross once for what? Ever and never needs to be repeated. And so it says here that those sacrifices couldn't make the comers thereunto, the worshipers, perfect. In what sense? Completely forgiven, completely accepted by God. Look at verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. If one of those sacrifices was efficacious and actually took away sin, then you'd never have to have another one, right? Because the people would be perfectly forgiven, past, present, and future. You never need to offer it again. And then he says... Because that the worship is once purged should have no more conscience of sins. In other words, if one time one of those sacrifices actually dealt with the sin issue, 
and satisfy the demands of God's righteousness, then the conscience of the believer would be free from guilt for their sins. They would be once what? Purged. How many times can you be cleansed by the blood of Christ to be saved? One time. Salvation is a one-time deal. What shall I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe right now, this minute. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe now with the results that will go on, what? Permanently and forever. Believe now and the Holy Spirit will come, regenerate, indwell, baptize you into Christ, and then what? Seal you, finishing the transaction. Done deal. There's no more water to be poured in. You've received the water of what? Life. No more to receive. There you go. Done deal, finished transaction. Salvation is yours. Now, the next step is learn the Word, get in a good Bible church, grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, serve Him, get to know Him, live a life that honors Him, and He'll bless you here as you grow, and He'll reward you in eternity for the good works you do. But whether you grow or you don't grow does not affect the fact that you have already received the gift. It's a done deal. Some Christians live for the Lord and are blessed in time and rewarded in eternity. <laughs> Other Christians don't grow, remain spiritual babies, and are saved as by fire, the Bible says, but saved nonetheless from the lake of fire. They never were saved from the power of sin, but they were saved from the lake of fire. So you notice here he says, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. If you're taught correctly by a truly prepared pastor about the grace of God, the work of the cross, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, you realize that the moment you believed in Christ, you were purged. You were cleansed by the blood of Christ once for all and forever, and it never needs to be repeated. And at that moment, your sins, past, present, and future, have been all forgiven. Isn't this a wonderful truth? See, salvation is a one-time event. And then when, once you receive it, then you're what? Sealed. It's a done deal. Now put it behind you and get down to the business of what? Growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Learn about your position in Christ. Learn about God's plan. Learn about his character like we're studying on Sunday. Begin to trust him and walk with him and serve him and believe him. And you know what? As you grow, God will continue to bless your life and he will reward you when you land in his kingdom. Fantastic. Okay, let's put this principle up on the board, our first principle for tonight, if we can. And here's our principle. Salvation from the penalty of sin. And you notice I, I, I'm, I'm definitely being very exact with the wording. Salvation from the penalty of sin, right? The first tense of salvation. Or hell is a one-time event a one-time transaction. Salvation from the penalty of sin is not a process. Okay? It is not a process. There are many churches today where they teach you that you get enough grace to get started, but you've got to keep believing and keep living holy, and if you don't, you're not going to finally be saved. You can lose it and be lost. Because they don't understand the regenerating work that is permanent, the indwelling work that is permanent, the baptizing work that is permanent, and the sealing work of the Holy Spirit that is permanent. All these works are permanent works of God through the Holy Spirit for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father planned the, the, the salvation, the Son purchased the salvation, the Holy Spirit applies the salvation. Okay? The next principle. So salvation is not believe and keep believing. It's not believe and live holy. It's not believe and hold on till the end. It's believe right now. The next principle. Once the gift of eternal life is received by faith, salvation is complete. Nothing further is required. And again, we're referring to salvation from what? The penalty of sin or the lake of fire, what we call hell. Let's repeat that. Let's read it one more time. Once the gift of eternal life is received by faith, Salvation is complete. It's a finished transaction, right? Done deal. Nothing further is required. 
the moment that the sinner believes the promise. Jesus said, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The moment that they believe the promise, they can confess right then and there, having believed, having had that inward conviction that what God promised is true, believing that promise, they don't have to pray a prayer to do this, it's just having faith in their what? heart, believing that it's true, at that moment they can confess, I am saved and saved forever, and God doesn't offer any other salvation except eternal salvation. Eternal security, sealing of the Spirit, is the gospel, okay? So once this gift is received, nothing further is required as far as salvation from the penalty of sin. You say, well, what about living the Christian life? Yes, that's important, but that is about your effort, your works, your growth in grace that does not affect the gift of eternal life or salvation from the penalty of sin. Is everybody with me on this one? Okay, let's make some progress. So note that it's by faith that a person is saved. The believer is born again, regenerated, forgiven of all sins, baptized into Christ, justified, declared righteous with this one-time transaction that has permanent results that last forever. This sealing of the Holy Spirit secures this transaction of salvation from the penalty of sin. By God's what? Grace. It is a gift received through what? Faith. Now, why by faith? Because faith is not a work. Faith is a non-meritorious act. Faith is simply persuasion, conviction, belief that something is true. Okay, now, there's a resurgence today in Christianity of Calvinism. Uh, if you study theology at any, uh, any length, or if you've studied here with me at any length, you've heard Calvinism mentioned before, and you've heard Arminianism mentioned before. And these are two systems of theology that are supposed to be opposite, but in the end they come down to really uh, teaching the same thing. Calvinism teaches that if you're one of God's chosen and predestined to heaven, then you will persevere in faith and holiness unto the end, and be saved. And they teach what's called the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, which is this. If you are born again and are a Christian, one of God's chosen, you will persevere all the way to the end in faith and holiness, and then you will be ultimately be, be saved. But if you don't persevere to the end, it's proof that you were never chosen, never predestined, and never saved. This is a false doctrine. Now, the Arminians who teach you get saved by grace, but you have to keep working at it and keep believing and keep living holy and not sin too bad. And then maybe if you hold on to the end, you'll get into what? The kingdom. Your Pentecostal type churches will teach that Methodism, Nazarene churches, all your cults, Roman Catholicism, which is the biggest cult going, okay? But and that's another story for another time. They teach that you have to persevere to be saved finally from the lake of fire. Now, if we see anything in Scripture, it's pretty clear that salvation from the penalty of sin is a one-time event. Okay? Let's look up here on the board. We've got another principle for you. We've got another principle for you, and it's this. And we'll look at some scriptures after we read this. Believers are preserved in Christ. Now notice, it's not the perseverance of the saints. You could call eternal security the preservation of the saints, right? Any ladies ever do any preserving? Anybody? Nobody does? Oh, there you go. Got a couple. Right, you know, which means you, you take it, you put it in the, the mason jars, and you preserve it, right? You keep it. Keeps it what? Good, so that you can eat it, right? preserve it. Now here's the thing. When a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, God puts the Spirit in them, seals them. Get it? Now they're preserved. He's going to preserve them. In other words, he's going to keep them in the condition of what? Salvation permanently. God preserves them. Uh, salvation is not dependent on, well, Mr. Believer now must better, better toe the line. Here he goes. 
Better not fall. Better, whoop, better get back up and toe the line. Okay? It's, guess what? You're saved here. You're going to heaven. That's guaranteed. You're sealed. Now, yeah, you should walk with the Lord. And as you walk with the Lord, you'll grow and you'll be blessed and you can honor God. And guess what? When you land in heaven over here, this is kind of silly, but it makes a point. When you land in heaven over here, God will reward you. But if you know what? If you fall right here, and if you fall right off the edge, and you never get back up, guess what? You're still landing in heaven. You get the picture? No blessing down here. No reward in eternity. Saved as by fire, but what? Saved anyway, because the gift was what? Received, and the transaction was complete. When that believer falls, he falls with what? The regenerating of the spirit. You can't lose being born again. Once you're born into God's family, it's forever. He falls with the indwelling of the spirit. He falls with the baptizing work of the spirit. He's still in Christ. Okay? And he falls with the sealing of the spirit. Okay? He's not being filled with the spirit. He's not growing. But he's saved. Okay. Let's go to Jude and just verse 1. There's only one chapter in Jude, so it'll be Jude verse 1. And that's right at the end of your New Testament. Look what's said here. Believers are preserved in Christ. They're kept by God's power. They're eternally secure. Look at verse 1. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. And notice what it says. And what? Preserved. It says preserved in Jesus Christ and called. You notice what it says? The believer is what? Preserved. God saves you and puts you into the state of salvation from the penalty of sin, lake of fire, and then he preserves you, or he what? Keeps you in that state. You don't keep yourself in it. God keeps you in it. Notice what it says preserved in Jesus Christ. You see? God preserves us in our salvation. It's not, oh, you have to persevere and hold out to the end and then, you, you know, it'll prove you're really saved and then you'll finally be saved. No. It's God saved you and now he'll keep you saved. He will preserve you in salvation. Okay. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. It says, of believers who are kept, and the word kept is, means to guard, to protect, by the power of God. So it's the omnipotence of God, which we'll be studying probably on Sunday. God's omnipotence, or his, the fact that he is all-powerful, who are kept, who are protected, who are guarded by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So what is he saying? We are guarded and protected and kept in the state of salvation by God's omnipotence. It's not by, my, I don't keep myself saved. I can't do that, neither can you. God preserves us in salvation. He keeps us saved. He sealed us by the Spirit to guarantee that. Okay, let's go to our next principle. This is kind of a review of some of the stuff, but I want to go over it again so you're clear on it. Sinners are to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, and that means salvation from the penalty of sin. Sinners are to believe. This is important. We're going to make a, a clear distinction here. Salvation is not a process. It's believing. Uh, turn me to Acts chapter 16, verse 30 to 31. Acts 16, verses 30 to 31. When you go out to share the gospel, you are sharing with people that Christ died for their sins 
And if they will believe in him as their savior, they will receive eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. The issue is not how they live. The issue is not them giving up their sins. The issue is not them turning over a new leaf. The issue is not them living a holy life. You cannot be saved by works. The issue isn't being baptized in water. The issue is not joining the church. The issue is not holding out to the end. The issue is not walking an aisle or raising their hand or praying a prayer or confessing Christ publicly. You know, there's, there's a lot of evangelists, you know, that, oh, you raise your hand if you want to be saved. Walk down this aisle. Pray this prayer. Uh, if you want to be saved, a very famous evangelist who passed away recently, and he, he did some good things, but this is wrong. And if it's wrong, you've got to say it. Billy Graham, he'd tell people, well, Christ, if you want to be saved, you've got to confess him publicly. Everyone he called, he called publicly. So come down here and confess him publicly. That is not necessary to be saved. Salvation is right where you're sitting. If you believe, you're saved. Right where you're sitting. You don't have to raise your hand, walk an aisle, or confess him. When it says if you confess him as Lord, it means to acknowledge, the word confess means to acknowledge that he is what? Deity, that he's the son of God. Okay, you have to believe in the right Jesus. The, the Jehovah Witnesses say they believe in Jesus, but it's not the Jesus of the Bible. They don't believe he's the second person of the Trinity like we taught on Sunday, that he's God the Son. They believe he's a created being, a lesser God, okay? You have to believe in the true biblical Jesus who is God the Son, the Son of God, deity in the flesh. And it, to confess him as Lord means to acknowledge that he is the Son of God, deity incarnate, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9, and 10, thou shalt be saved. And then it says, with the mouth, with the heart, man believes to righteousness, you're declared righteous, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. There are a lot of organizations that say they're evangelistic, but they do not preach the correct gospel. The gospel is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as we'll see in a minute. It's not raise your hand, walk an aisle, hold out to the end, pray a prayer, confess Christ publicly, get baptized, join the church, give up sin, etc. So when you go out to speak to people, the issue is this. Faith alone in Christ alone. That Christ died for their sins, offers them eternal life if they will believe on him Christ will forgive them and save them and they shall receive eternal life. And if they're convinced of that, that he is the Son of God who guarantees them eternal life and they believe it, then you can tell them with confidence you are saved. And if you believe that, you have the right to say, I am saved. Not I will be saved, not I hope I'm going to be saved, not I'm trying to be saved. I am saved, done deal accomplished over with it's now behind you the split second after you believe salvation's done from the penalty of sin now you need to start growing in the Christian life and be saved from the power of sin Acts chapter 16 verse 30 to 31 and Paul to the Philippian jailer after they were delivered from the jail and it says, they brought them out and said, Sirs, he brought them out, and the Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What could be more simple? What must I do to be saved? Verse 31. And they said, now that's Paul and Silas, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized and live right, repent of your sins, confess Christ as Lord, and hold out to the end. Is that what it says? Well, why are all these people teaching that? Why are they teaching that? Well, they'll run to this verse and to that verse, and they'll say, well, look at this verse over here. Look at this verse over here. What's the problem? They take verses out of context, verses that talk about perseverance for rewards or losing rewards, or verses that deal with severe chastisement in a believer's life if a believer falls into sin, and they try to apply them to salvation. They're not rightly dividing the word of truth. What did Paul and Silas say? And they said, believe right now on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he is the Son of God. And thou shalt be, what? Saved in thy house. Now, did he mean that all your house would be saved if you believe? No. The idea is, 
you believe, and if they believe, they'll be saved too. It's, in other words, it's open to everybody. Not just you, but your family also. If they believe, they shall be saved. You've got to rightly divide the word. You've got to understand context. So that's salvation. Sin is out of what? Believe. When you witness to somebody, do not raise false issues. Do not talk about how they're living, their sins. None of that is the issue. Christ paid for their sins on the cross. And they don't have the power to change or live for God because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. But the moment they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and by faith accept him, they receive what? The Spirit. Regenerated, indwelt, baptized, sealed. Now they have the power potentially to what? Overcome sin if they're willing to learn the Word of God and grow and walk by faith. But salvation is a done deal. You see? So don't raise false issues. The most important thing is that they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they recognize their need of Christ and that they believe in Him. Next point, principle I want to put up here. Okay, so we believe for salvation from the penalty of sin. And, and then after you're saved, is there perseverance involved in the Christian life? Yes, but not to get to heaven, not to get into the kingdom, not to get saved from the penalty of sin. Believers are called to persevere in the faith for what? Rewards. We're called to endure, to patiently endure, to persevere, to hold on, to hold out, to hold fast. But to be saved from hell? No. To receive what? Rewards. Blessing and rewards. Blessing in time, rewards in what? Eternity. Let me show you a couple verses. Go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. Again, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Uh, uh, Paul in the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews has a bunch of passages that trouble people, that make them think they can lose salvation. We'll, we've gone over them in the past, and we'll study them again in the future. And these passages are written to Hebrews, Jews, who are tempted to go back to Judaism. And Paul is warning them, if you go back to Judaism, you're forfeiting all your privileges in Christ, and you are not going to reign and rule with Christ. You see, Every believer has an inheritance. You're going to land in heaven. You're going to have face-to-face -face fellowship with the Lord. You're going to have a glorified, resurrected body. But not every believer is going to rule with Christ. Every believer is an heir of Christ and has an inheritance, but not every believer is a joint heir. The joint heir means to join with Christ in ruling over his inheritance in the kingdom. And only those who rule are those who persevere with him. You see? Every believer is an heir in the sense of they have an inheritance. They're going to get a glorified body. They're going to be happy in heaven. But only those who persevere will be joint heirs, will be given the ability to rule. Remember the, parable, the ability to rule. Remember the parable of the talents? Guy gets 10, guy gets 5, guy gets 1, right? Remember that? Luke 19. Lord comes back. He said, occupy till I come. He comes back. He says, all right, let's, let's tally things up here. What would you do with what I gave you? A guy had 10, he turns it into another 10, he says, great, I'll make you ruler over what? 10 cities. You get to rule over 10 cities. You were faithful, you persevered, you used what I gave you, now I'm going to make you rule over 10 cities. The other fellow says, oh, I had five, I made five more. Hey, great job, good, good job, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You used what I gave you, and now I'm going to let you rule over what? Five cities. says to the fellow with one, well, let's see what you produce. He said, well, you know what I did? Look, it's over here, I hid it in the napkin, right? I hid it in the cloth. Uh, which you used to wipe the sweat of your brow. He, he didn't get busy serving the Lord, seeking the Lord, growing, okay? And the Lord says, you're a wicked servant. Take what he has and give it to the one who what? Has five and ten. What happened? He lost his reward, okay? Did the Lord say to him, well, you can rule over one city? He said, no, you didn't produce anything. You didn't even take the one and produce another one. He said, you could have at least given it to the banker and got some interest on it, right? You could have done something with it. You didn't do anything. You can't rule with me. 
an heir, but not a joint heir. You see? And to, let me say this to you folks. I'm going to tell you something. You sit here tonight, and you look at life, and you're in church, and you say, well, I believe in Jesus. I'm happy I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. And, you, and some folks are taking their spiritual life really seriously and realizing, you know, as time goes by, I'm getting older. The day of my death or the Lord's coming is getting closer, and you don't know when that's going to be your day of your death. It could happen any time. not trying to scare you, but it could be tonight, could be tomorrow, maybe another 30 years. I hope so, for, you know, if that's God's will. But here's the point. You're not taking your spiritual life seriously, using what he's given you for him and for his kingdom. And here's the thing. It may not seem like a big deal today. Maybe you're enjoying other things. You're not making any sacrifice for the Lord today. You're not taking up your cross and denying self what you want to do God's will. Because it takes sacrifice to serve the Lord. Okay? And you know what? You're going to get to heaven, thank God, saved, thank God. But in that day, when all this, this building will be gone, because the Bible says God's going to shake this old world, and the only things that are going to be remaining are the things that cannot be shaken. Read Hebrews 11. Okay? The end of it. The first part talks about the faith of people. The only things that will remain, are, it might be even Hebrews 12, the only things that are going to remain are the things that cannot be shaken. Okay? And in that day, the important things are not going to be what kind of house you have, how much money you have in the bank, how physically fit you were. Did you travel the world and see a lot of places? All your entertainment, did you have a good time? Was it fun? not going to matter. The only thing that will be of value in that day that everybody will value, because the Bible says this, this whole world is going to vanish away. God's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And the only thing that people will value in that day is what did you do for Christ? In that day, I'm just going to say it now, at the judgment seat of Christ, when you go to see what your reward is, and the judgment seat of Christ is not about sin, you're already saved, it's about what's the reward going to be. In that day, if you did nothing, if you were like that fellow who was the wicked servant and hid his talent and you produced nothing, right now it may not seem like a big deal because you're doing your thing and you're enjoying yourself. Yeah, I'm just happy I'm going to heaven. In that day, all of a sudden, you're going to realize that your life on earth, the sum of it, was a big fat zero. Because when you get into God's kingdom, the only things that count are the things of God. One life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We are called to live lives of eternal significance. The lives that we are living now have eternal significance. We should live every day in the light of eternity. Yes, our salvation is paid for. It's a done deal. We can't lose it, and we're grateful for that. But that doesn't mean that the Christian life is over. It has just begun. Because when we stand before the Lord, he's going to want to know, what'd you do for me? What'd you do with what I gave you? Did you grow? Did you serve? Did you give? Did you pray? Did you help others? Did you sacrifice? Did you persevere till the end? Were you faithful to the end? Doing what I called you to do? Did you do what you could with what I gave you? He's not asking you to conquer the world. Did you do what you could with what I gave you? That's all he asks. He told the fellow with the, the one talent, you know, you could have at least got some interest on it, right? I wasn't asking you to conquer the world. You could have at least done something. Now, here's the thing I'm trying to point, I'm trying to make. In that day, you're going to say to yourself, gee, what the heck did I do? I missed out. The sum of my life on earth, my eternal significance for Christ is nothing. I received this grace, I'm in heaven, I'll be happy. But at that moment, there will be a pause because the Bible says that there will be some people when the Lord comes who will be ashamed for a moment. Not forever, but for a moment. Now, let me just ask you something. What everybody values today will not be of value in God's kingdom. First will be last, the last shall be first. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be your what? Servant. In the world, the greatest is the one who gets everybody to serve them. But in my kingdom, the greatest is the one who serves what? Others. You realize that everything that we live for and our priorities and our thinking in this world is going to have a paradigm shift when the kingdom comes? 
it's going to be totally reversed. And then everything that we valued in this life will mean nothing. The only thing that will mean anything will be, did we live for Christ? Do we have lives of eternal significance? Did we do something for the Lord in persevering in it that he can reward, which gives us significance for all eternity? That's what we have to think about as Christians. That's my challenge to you. Look what it says here. Paul challenges these Hebrews. Don't go back to Judaism. If you go back to Judaism and you start offering sacrifices of animals after you believed in Christ, you're, you're, you're blaspheming. You're stomping all over the blood of Christ. You're saying the blood of Christ was not what? Sufficient or efficacious because you're order, offering a sacrifice of a lamb after believing in the what? Son of God who died for you. You see? It's apostasy. And he says, look, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of what? Reward. Hang in there. Persevere. I know it's tough. I know there's challenges. I know there's tests. I know there's opposition. I know you're persecuted for your faith. But hang in there because God's going to reward you if you hang in there. Persevere. Look at verse 36. For you have need of what? Patience. Now the word here, patience, also means endurance or what? Perseverance. Means to patiently what? Do God's will. That after ye have done the will of God, in other words, persevere in doing right, being in church, giving, praying, studying the word, serving where you can, helping others when you can. God's not asking you to conquer the world, but as you have opportunity, use what you have what he's given you for what? His kingdom. Ye might receive the promise. Listen, I want to tell you something, folks. And I, I, I've seen it ever since I've been in the ministry. People serve and their heart's in it. And every, every one of us, we start off right and our heart's in it. But I want to tell you something. The biggest test is this. When, it's, when, when the going gets tough and there's opposition and nobody... It seems to care. Are you still going to hang in there and keep going what? Forward for the Lord. Don't get discouraged. God sees your labor. That's what say. Oh, go over to Hebrews 6. Let's, let's read that verse. Hebrews 6, verses 10 to 12. Here's the thing we need to understand. Salvation is a one-time event. Blessing and reward depend on what? Perseverance, faithfulness, doing something. Salvation is free. Discipleship costs. The fellow had a, a napkin, which basically was a handkerchief. Remember the, the parable? He took the towel and he hid it in the handkerchief. What are you supposed to use a handkerchief for? Whew. Man, it's, I'm sweating because I'm working what? So hard, Right? But he didn't, he didn't do anything, right? He wasted his talent. Don't be like that. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Look at verses 10 to 12. Here's some encouragement. And it's so easy to get discouraged, folks. Listen, I've been at this 18 years. I've learned to lift the shield of faith to overcome discouragement. And you know what I've also learned? When I get discouraged and I'm down and I'm tired and I don't think, I had just the most awful, you know, day today. I, I wanted time to do certain things and I just couldn't get to it. I was tired, I was weary, didn't get it. I felt like terrible. But I said, Lord, on my way up, I, I got a nice coffee and I sipped on it and I prayed. I said, Lord, you know, <laughs> I got nothing tonight. I said, I, I got nothing tonight. I'm worn, I'm tired. But you know what, Lord, I said, I'm believing that you're going to empower me by your spirit to give something to your people. I studied, I prepared, but I didn't have the energy or the desire at that moment. But you know what? God is faithful. I got here, I had my prayer time, opened up the book, here I am. And I pray that it would be a blessing and a challenge to you. 
because I want you to understand something. We all get discouraged. The test is to persevere through the discouragement and keep what? Serving. Even when, even when everybody else falls by the wayside. Listen, I don't serve the Lord because everybody else is serving the Lord. I serve the Lord because I'm accountable to who? Him. You see? So if everybody else decides, well, you know what, Pastor, it's been fun, but I'll see you later. I'm going to keep showing up as long as there's breath in my lungs and as long as the door's open, right? What I do for the Lord does not depend on what other people are or aren't doing. And we've got to get that in our mind because, you know, we get called to serve and we have to be a team, right? And isn't it wonderful when everybody functions as a team? That's great, right? We're trying to build that here, right? But suppose people on the team are not doing their part, not hanging in there, not holding up, holding out their end, falling by the wayside. What are you going to do then? You're going to join them? No. Look at verse 10 and 12. Look what it says. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of what? Love. In other words, the Lord sees what you're doing. He sees what you're doing. Don't worry. Remember, remember Peter and, and John in uh, John chapter 21? Remember? And uh, Peter says to the Lord, Peter always putting his foot in his mouth. He points to John. He, you know, well, what, what shall this man do? In other words, what are you going to give him to do, Lord? I know what you told me I'm supposed to do, but what are you going to give? You told me to feed the lambs. You told me three times. Well, what, what about this man? What shall this man do? Jesus said, what is that unto thee? <laughs> That's none of your business. You feed my lambs. In other words, don't worry whether he's doing what I called him to do or not. Don't worry if he's holding up his end of this team called the apostles, the twelve. You do what you're supposed to do. That's between me and him. And don't stop doing what I called you to do because he ain't doing what he's supposed to do. You get the picture? Hold up your end and don't worry about the other guy. And sometimes you get narrowed down to where there's what? Not too many people. Should you give up? Should you get discouraged? You just keep what? You just keep going. Right? Because the Lord sees. He says, look, verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of what? Love, which you have showed towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God sees what you're doing. God's writing it all down. Nobody else may be noticing today, but guess what? The Lord's got it all written down. There is a day of accounting coming, a day of reckoning, where he's going to pull up the accounts and say, okay, let's see if you're going to get a reward. And there it is, written. You know what? You remained faithful. Others fell by the wayside. Others got discouraged. Others quit. Others were up and down. But you stayed steadfast. You persevered. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's your reward. Join air. Rule with me. Think about it. Keep breathing. And Paul said, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Now, what is the full assurance of hope? Is that to be saved from hell? No, they've already been saved. The full assurance of hope to the end is to have confidence that when the end of their life comes, they can look back and say, I lived a life of eternal significance. I wasn't perfect, made some mistakes, I, I messed up. But you know what? I stayed what? I got back up when I fell, I got back up. Well, yeah, I got discouraged, I got down, I struggled, but I got back up and I kept what? Going. Remember this. We're called to persevere. It is required in the steward that he be found what? Faithful. At the end of the Apostle Paul's life, and I'm going to close here because I'm run out of time. Isn't that interesting? Now I feel like preaching more. When I got here, I didn't feel like speaking at all. You know, folks, I'm going to tell you, you just try God at this, okay? You know, when, when you're down and tired and you don't feel like, you know, you know you're in a ministry or whatever it is, even just prayer, and you don't feel like doing it, you say to God, Lord, I can't, but I'm going to trust you to empower me. And you'll see what God will do some amazing things. And then you realize it's not about me, it's about him. It's about his power. But 
you remember at the end of his life, the Apostle Paul's writing to Timothy, and he said, look, I know that there's what? A crown of righteousness laid up for me. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. He had a what? Confidence. He had the full assurance of hope to the end. Not to be rescued from hell. He already had that the moment he believed on the Damascus Road many years, decades earlier. But he was talking about the reward, being a joint heir with Christ, ruling with Christ, hearing, well done, thou good and faithful servants. We're in a crown. Having a life of eternal what? Significance in the kingdom. You see? And we can be confident. God's not asking us to be perfect. He's not asking us to conquer the world. He's asking us, do the best you can with what I give you and just be faithful. And don't look at other people, whether they're doing it or not doing it. You just look at me, because you're going to have to stand before me. And I know when I stand before the Lord, if I may use you as an example, Steve, I don't think you'll mind. God's not going to say, uh, you know, John, you were supposed to do this, this, and that. And I'm going to say, well, you know, I expected Steve to be there and do that. And the Lord's going to say, you don't worry, I'll, me and Steve, we'll talk. Right? I'm just you know, losing an example. Pardon me. Okay? Or anybody. No, what did you do, Richie? Okay? In other words, I can't point to someone else and say, well, you know, what about them? What shall this man? No, no. What did you do? Get your eyes off of people, folks. Get your eyes off of people. Get your eyes on who? Jesus. Are you with me? Pardon me, because you are a faithful brother, but <laughs> I'm just using the example. Okay? Verse 12. that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You see, what is inheriting the promises? Inheriting the promise means all the added blessings that go along with being what? An heir, saved, ruling with Christ, being given special privileges in the kingdom, special rewards. The Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard. You know, and some Christians have to realize something. We're going to close there tonight. That not every Christian is going to have the same quality, okay, of eternal life in this sense. They're all going to live forever. But the Bible talks about, you know, that some are going to rule and some are going to... It talks about there will be the least in the kingdom and there will be what? The greatest. Listen, you... No matter how you try to get around it, you can't. It's there. Okay? Salvation from the lake of fire, everybody who believes gets that. That's what? That's the bottom line, right? That's the minimum. But what you build on top of that, that depends on you and your choices and your faithfulness and your growth. We're saved by believing in one moment in time, right? And it's permanent. But we are blessed and rewarded by persevering. And here's the challenge tonight. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. It's not easy to serve the Lord. It is a lot of challenges. And many times, nobody notices and nobody cares. Right? But listen, God is not what? Unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. God sees that you love him and you love his people and you love his church and you're doing the best you can. He sees. And really, folks, that's all that really matters in the end, right? Isn't that it? It's all that matters in the end that he sees, right? Doesn't matter that anybody else sees, right? It's nice to get a pat on the back once in a while, right? We all like that. But listen, you know the great, you know the pat on the back I want? I hope you want it. When I stand before Jesus one day, I want him to pat me on the back and say, well done, son. Well done. You weren't perfect, you messed up, but you hung in there. And you kept at it. I want that pat on the back, more than any other pat on the back that I could get. Are you with me? Amen. Let's, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, tonight we're grateful and thankful to have had this time to note and study these things from your word. And I pray that you challenge our hearts, Lord. To understand that salvation is a 
finished work in a one-time transaction, a single event at a moment of time where we receive the gift of eternal life, and it's ours forever. And I pray that we'd be challenged to take that gift and use it, use the power that you've given us, the power of your spirit, to live for you, to honor you, to persevere, to serve you faithfully, that we might be blessed in time and rewarded in eternity. We dedicate the last moment to anyone here tonight if you're not saved. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right now you can tell God, I know I'm a sinner, but I do believe. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, God will save you right where you are. Let's take a moment of silence. Now, Father, if your Holy Spirit has spoke to anybody's heart tonight that listened to this message, uh, I pray, Lord, that if they have believed on the Lord Jesus, that you'd give them assurance that you've forgiven them and saved them. Lord, I ask that you'd reveal your love to them in a special way, and I pray that you lead them back to study your word that they would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we depart tonight, I pray that you take the written word and make the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, more real to our hearts and minds. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Folks, it's been a pleasure. There will be service on Friday evening. Bible study right here in the chapel. Have a great night.